start with, sing a couple of songs here, and then get right into the right into the teaching this morning or this afternoon. Number eighty-seven in the green hymn book. Number 263 in the blue hymn book. Let's switch hymn books to 263. 263. The Lord's a rock in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure.
seated. All right, welcome this afternoon. Uh, we've got a couple guests to introduce real quick. Uh, some familiar faces to some of you. Brother Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Anthony, you want to introduce yourself? With, with, a, with a purple shirt and a flower tie to go with it. <laughs> All right, and then Brother Bisco, come on ahead. Uh, some of you may remember him. He came through um, heading to Georgia, raising support. I asked him to speak for a few minutes this afternoon to tell us what it means to be a missionary on deputation, what that's about. So not necessarily about missions, um, but just talk a little bit about what deputation is about, maybe what he's learned from it, what it's taught him, why you should never do it yourself or however he wants to present this. <laughs> and... Uh, and then we'll have our regular question and answer this afternoon. All right, yes, my name is Joe Bisco. Uh, there are some of you that know me here. It is good to see familiar faces coming back. Um, it's good to see new faces, and there's uh, obviously praise the Lord for that, but I also uh, have gotten to the point now where it's, it's really nice to see the old faces too. I mean, familiar faces. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant to say. <laughs> I meant familiar. Um, what? Oh, okay, all right. Um, I came through here uh, June of last year, I think it was. And then uh, we presented the work where my family and I were headed to the, the Republic of Georgia. That's uh, just south of Russia and east of the Black Sea, if you want to find it on the map. And um, the Lord has finished our deputation. We are getting ready to leave in October. Um, we've got plane tickets to leave October 4th, and so we're getting ready to go over there. And Brother Isaac, uh, he, he asked me to, to talk about deputation kind of specifically, and he said, don't prepare anything. And so I didn't. So I'm just doing what the pastor told me to do. So uh, what, is, what does it mean to be on deputation as a mission? First, missions. I mean, I think you guys are pretty, pretty uh, clear on this. But missions, the word missionary is not in the Bible. You're not going to find it. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul calls it an ambassador for Christ. And that's really what uh, we're doing. And, um, of course, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, uh, there's the commission given to the New Testament church to go out and reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so an ambassador goes out and does that for Jesus Christ. And so really what we should probably call ourselves ambassador, but who cares, right? It's just a term. And like this morning, bishop, pastor, I mean, uh, six, one, half dozen of the other. So we call, we call ourselves missionaries, and what we're doing is we're going over to Georgia. We're going to learn the language, learn the culture, and then minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And it's funny, actually, take your Bible, go to Romans 10, get Romans 10 and Deuteronomy 30 in, in one hand. This is kind of interesting. Yeah, see, um, Paul, all, all the time throughout his letters, obviously the Lord leaned him to do so, will grab just a little snippet from the Old Testament and then he'll apply it to the church. And it's kind of funny how this, this matches up here in Romans chapter 10. Obviously, this is the uh, passage that really goes through the simplicity of getting saved and how easy it is in the New Testament uh, during the church age. Obviously, we don't have to give sacrifices or anything like that. We don't have to meet on a certain day. We don't have to, anything like that. Faith in Jesus Christ alone and how simple that is. And coming down through there, notice what he says in, uh, actually, I, I do want you to go to De Deuteronomy 30 first, if you don't mind. But uh, now that I've set it up for Romans 10, I'm going to switch gears. Deuteronomy chapter 30, I want to, uh, this is just interesting how, I wonder if Paul was reading this while he was in, in Arabia and the Lord gave him this. But in Deuteronomy 30, Moses is recounting the law, and he has given it to the Israelites before he passes off the scene here. And in verse 11, Deuteronomy 30 and verse 11, look at what he says here. He says, For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou should say, Who shall go up uh, for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh thee, a very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. 
And so he's telling them, the Lord's brought this thing right to your doorstep. Uh, you don't have to get on a ship, go overseas. You don't have to climb the Tower of Babel to get to heaven or anything like that. The Lord's brought it right here to your doorstep. Now look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 10. See how this, see how this almost matches up here. Romans chapter 10, if, if you've got your hand there, we'll pick it up in verse 6. Romans 10 and verse 6, he says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. And so faith cometh by hearing, of course, in verse 17, and hearing by the word of God. You got saved because somebody told you about Jesus Christ. You read it in a gospel track. Or you were reading the Bible. Somehow, the words of God got to you, and you believed them and agreed with them and then acted on them. The salvation, like very simply, that's what it is. And so now that you have it and it's at your doorstep, the question is, who are you going to give it to so it's near and nigh unto them? And so missions is taking it across the sea. I mean, you folks do this here in the States. You go out, you knock on doors, you pass out tracts in your daily life, you go street preaching, those things. That is a missionary effort in your hometown. What we do is we just go over the sea and do that. Now it's a little bit more involved and I, maybe I'll scare you out of being a missionary this morning, I don't know, but deputation is the first step uh, in answering the call to the mission field. And it's very important, it is very important, that you know you are called to the mission field. I, I don't know how anyone else would handle this necessarily, but I get around some people I was in a mission conference with one guy, and he's, he's the main speaker, and I'm giving my testimony about how the Lord called me, and I make the differentiation between a calling and a burden. You can have a burden to do something for God, and praise the Lord for it, you ought to have burdens. But a calling is something different. That is the Lord saying, I want you to do this very specific thing. That's direction from God saying, I, you, I want you to do this. Paul gets the uh, calling to go to the Gentiles. That's his direction from God. But what's he do? He, his burden keeps trying to get him back to the Jews. David has a burden to build the temple. And the Lord says, no, that's not for you to do. That's for your son to do. So we're talking about calling. It can change throughout your life. But it's a very, dis it's a very distinct direction from God that he wants you to do something. If you don't know that and you start deputation... <laughs> man I'm going to read about you <laughs> like, because listen brethren uh, deputation is the act of deputizing I was here when brother Rue was here July 4th last, last, last year and, 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 and he gave a good definition of it we go out and we, we call pastors and we say listen the Lord's called me to go overseas and the Bible principle for this is that you don't muzzle the ox when he treads, treads the corn, okay? So the pastor is generally supported by the church he's, he's over. And then a missionary, if he can't work in the country and all these things are, are against him. So we raise support from the states to go overseas to do this, uh, this, this ministry. And you're not going to find deputation in the Bible. But you do find the Holy Spirit saying, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I called on them to do. And uh, you do see them going out and... You see Paul's, you know, we call it Paul's missionary journeys, his, his three journeys there. And you see how he goes from place to place. He preaches Jesus Christ crucified. He raises up a flock of people, and then he moves on. And that's, that's his ministry throughout the New Testament. That's where we get the New Testament books. So that missions today is, is a continuation of that. And to get that done, money needs to be raised. Now, I hate money just as much as the next person, all right? I'm not good with money because I hate it so much. I don't like talking about it. If somebody hands me a check, I don't look at it. Like a brother recently, he was like, here you go, brother. I hope this really helps you. And I just, I just deadlocked him right in the eyes. I was like, thank you, brother. Like, I'm looking at that later. I don't want this to, to hurt the conversation we're having. <laughs> I hate it, all right? It stinks. It, 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 it shouldn't matter, but it does. And it's like, oh, I hate this stupid thing we have to deal with. That gets you into trouble, too. So, <laughs> But it's the truth. Uh, things nowadays, it doesn't work on a barter system. It doesn't work on anything like that. It just works on money. So deputation is the act of going out and raising financial support to go overseas and minister the gospel. We call it deputation because it's you saying, it's like deputizing somebody like uh, the sheriff would deputize deputies to go out in his name and 
do the work of the law. It's like that, where the body, because we're independent Baptists, we're not, we don't have like a governing or, or, you know, organization over us that says, hey, everybody that's part of our organization, we have this missionary here, you all are going to support him now. <laughs> no, we're independent, and the Bible uh, uh, shows us that the, the independent uh, local assembly there makes the decisions, and so we go around as missionaries, we visit churches, we let folks know what we're doing, and then you decide whether or not you're going to support what we're doing. Not everybody does, some do. It's just the way it is. Now, the reason why I laughed, <laughs> if, if you think you're going to start deputation and not have a calling from God, is because there's, there's a few things that I've learned on deputation. And the things that I've learned are, number one, deputation is not about money. If you think it is, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Like, it's just, I can't help you. If, uh, if you're out to, to, if your mindset is I need to raise this amount of money and I'm going to go out and get this amount of money and you go through deputation like that, you're going to miss it. Deputation is what the Lord uses today to mold the man to get ready to step onto the field. And if you don't get that down, you will step on the field and you will be off in six months. I guarantee it. There are going to be things that will happen to you on, on deputation that you can't explain to anybody else. Like up here, I don't even know what to say, all right? I feel like I'm back from Iraq trying to explain Fallujah to you. All right? I don't know how to. I don't know how to get this across. All right, but I've learned this: is that the Lord's always right. The Lord will always take care of you if you're doing what He wants you to do. And if you think deputation is for you, then I'm going to ask you these three questions: Do you want family trouble? Do you want money trouble? Do you want health trouble? Do you want brethren trouble? <laughs> Is that what you want? Because in deputation might be for you. <laughs> and you, you tell people that, they look at you like a tree full of owls, like most of you are looking at me right now, and I get it. But you get people that have that, that take issue with where I'm from, I'm from PBI, that's my sending church, Brother Donald's my pastor. I had a guy one time, he, he didn't read the packet that I sent, like on the top of the packet is a recommendation letter from my pastor, Brian Donovan. This guy, I'm scheduled to be with him Sunday. We're at Brother Andrews' church with Anthony there, and we're scheduled to leave out Saturday. So this is Friday night. I get a text from this guy. He's like, hey, brother, I need to know your stand on Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. I just got around to reading your material. Well, I sent it eight months ago. Thanks for finally reading this. But <laughs> uh, as far as Dr. Ruckman is concerned, I think he's the best Bible teacher this world's ever seen. I think he's one of the greatest pastors as well, and I think the same thing about Brother Donovan. Okay, brother, well, you've been led astray. Uh, you're following a man, and we wouldn't support you, so we're going to cancel the meeting. I'm set to leave the next day. <laughs> uh, you'll have a, this happen to you every now and then. You'll, you'll schedule a meeting out so far because the brother really wants to have you in, and so you go to it. It's a 10-hour drive one way. You've got to get the hotels and the food and all that stuff. And you're just like, all right, Lord, I guess we're going. <laughs> you know? and it's could, it could be I'm just an idiot, but I was like, all right, Lord, whatever door you open, I'll go through. And so we go through it. So it's a 20-hour uh, round trip. It's two nights in, in a hotel, and it's food for the family and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, you get done preaching, you get down, and, you know, you get a check for 350 bucks. It's a $1,000 trip. By the time you factor gas and food and hotel stays and all that. See? I see. I start talking about money. It was like, he just wants money. No. What I found out later was that that uh, the Lord actually gave me something new to preach and a brother came to the church because I was there just like something new that was at the church and he came in and sat down and the message I was preaching was Baptist problems and there's four problems that you run into if you're going to serve God there's four problems you run into and, 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 and that was the sermon and he during the invitation went down the altar got right with God and was going to commit back to coming to church and stuff and so uh, I'll say this there's a lot of trouble on deputation <laughs> All right, so if you think you're going to start it and not have a call from God, you're an idiot, all right? That's all I'm going to say. You need to have that call. But what you learn is that my, my, my reward is not here. That's what you learn, is that you're doing what the Lord told you to do, and it doesn't matter what your reward is here. My reward's ahead of me. And that's where most Christians won't get to. You won't get to the point where you're willing to let go of what you have here to get something there. And Jim Elliott said it, and he said it best. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
And until you get there, your missions will always be a mystery to you. Deputation will always be a mystery to you. Pastoring will be a, mis- will, will be a mystery to you. Because you've got to get to the point where you realize that here and now doesn't matter. My life doesn't matter. What the Lord puts me through down here to learn more, none of that really matters. What matters is am I, am, am I pleasing him and will it count for eternity? And that's what you have to go off of. So hopefully I've scared you out of deputation. Kiddos are dismissed. I don't know what country has this saying. I think it was Germany, but it doesn't really matter. God knows what he's doing, and nobody else does. So, kind of up to you just to figure out if you're going to trust him or not. Okay, let's get Hebrews chapter um, 10, I believe. Got a question and answer for the foreseeable future. Hebrews 10, and I'll give you these questions and we'll answer them as best we have time today to answer them. I've got some good ones coming up, including today. I'll just let you wait. All right, so today is uh, four questions on this uh, question on the same topic. And we're going to take these slightly out of order, but let me give you the four questions, and we'll pray, and we'll get some answers here. Uh, Question number one, after salvation, can you stop sinning? It's a tricky question. It's a good question. As soon as you say yes, you say, well... As soon as you say no, you say, well, okay, all right, that's a good question. Number two, this is the one we're going to look at first. What are the verses used by sinless perfectionists to prove sinless perfection? Okay, that's in Hebrews 10, and we'll come through a couple more. Three, what are the damaging effects of believing sinless perfection? And four, what does scripture actually say about perfection? All right, so I like this, I like these detailed cards because... I tend to teach a lesson that I've already prepared or the way I understand it in my mind to address it, and then when you put it into your words and frame it, then it locks me into answering it from the way that you asked the question. So I'll attempt to do that as best I can. Hebrews 10, uh, we'll read a verse here in just a second. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for testimony from Brother Bisco. Lord, I ask that you please uh, help him continuing on the rest of the way. Lord, thank you for what you have shown him, and uh, we're all growing. If we're going through trouble, we're we're grown we're going through trouble and lord i ask that you'd help him to be a blessing over there overseas when he arrives as you help him to learn the language uh quickly and as reasonably fast as possible help him to be able to get into the work of the ministry over there and be a be a help to what's already uh just very beginnings of what's being started in that country lord i ask that you please uh, bless the churches for supporting him as you'd uh, help him to continue living by faith and trust in you as you help us to follow his example and practice the preaching that he's put into uh, words and also put into his life. Lord, I ask please bless these uh, questions and answers in scripture that we're going to look at this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Why would somebody say you can be sinlessly perfect? Meaning that you're not sinning after you get saved. Here's why. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 26, 4, if we sin, what's the next word? Willfully. <clears throat> if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. If I was going to teach sinless perfection from this verse, I would say, you see that verse? It says that if you sin on purpose, willfully, with your will, will of man, then there's no way you can have a sacrifice for sins anymore, no longer can be saved. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, that awfully sounds a lot like hell, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy? Who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So why do people believe 
that you can lose your salvation if you sin after you're saved? Well, because of verses like that. Look down at verse 38. Verse 38, now the just shall live by what? Faith. But if any man draw back, he loses his salvation. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. That does sound like hell again, like uh, the devil and the son of perdition in Revelation. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Now, according to those verses, at the surface reading, just a cursory reading of those verses, would you agree that it sounds like you can lose your salvation for sinning? Can we all be in agreement with that, no matter how Baptist you are? Okay? All right? I don't care if you have a Baptist suit on and the Baptist logo inside and you are a ba Baptist. I don't care how Baptist you are. Can you agree with what that text says? Looks like somebody's losing their salvation with a fiery indignation. All right? Go over to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. You're not reading a Baptist book. You're reading a history book. You're reading a perfect and complete and inerrant and inspired and infallible and perfect history book. Hebrews 6. And I hate to break it to you, but it's not all written to you. You realize every book and every page you read, you're reading somebody else's mail. And some of it applies to you, but you are reading a letter written from somebody to somebody else, and uh, the Lord had you in mind, but the author did not know who you were. All right, Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, I'll clarify myself here as we go. Look at verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto, there's our word, perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Skip down to verse uh, 5. Uh, 4 is the beginning of the sentence, for it is impossible. Uh, but we'll pick that up in a minute. Verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. So the Holy Ghost is in verse 4, somebody who is our partaker of the Holy Ghost. If they fall away in verse 6, it's impossible. Verse 4, back to verse 6 to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So what that's saying here is if this person he's addressing this to sins and they don't have, uh, they had the Holy Ghost, then the sin that they committed after they received the Holy Ghost put Christ back on the cross and crucified him again, crucified him afresh and put him to open shame. All right, so does that sound like somebody if they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again into repentance. Can we agree that that sounds like that? Now, I didn't say what does Warren Wearsby say or what does M.R. DeHaan say or what does Schofield or Oliver B. Green, I have all of their stuff in my text here, and all of them take a Baptist position and all of them say this actually teaches Baptist doctrine, but I just took too much grammar in high school and uh, enough grammar to know that that did not say that you should be a Baptist and you can't lose it if you were really saved. Now, if you were really, 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 really saved, then you're okay. But if you're only really, 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 really saved, you're not okay. Come on. I mean, you've heard the Baptist preacher say, now, if you're really saved, if you really believe it, if you really mean it, now, if you really, I'm not really saved. I'm not really, really saved. I'm not really, really, really saved. I'm not ten really saved. I'm saved. That's it. I'm saved. If you're really, really saved, then we can talk afterwards and find out how saved you are. Let me quote, let me quote a preacher of mine. When I was in high school, I went to a Christian school, and the school has a church, like usually is the case. So that pastor was preaching our chapel, and he said if, his name was Pastor Dixon, he's still pastoring today. He said if Pastor Dixon ever falls away and falls back into sin, don't say Pastor Dixon lost his salvation. Say Pastor Dixon never was saved. And I said, are you saved today? I didn't say anything because it's chapel, but in my mind I said, are you saved or are you not saved right now? So I didn't know the answers and I didn't know what to tell him and I didn't argue with people. I just took notes and saved them and found some answers later. Now, let me give you a little bit of help in Bible 101. Turn to Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. And sometimes 
the first verse of the chapter and the first verse of the book will tell you who this is written to. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, verse 2, spoken unto us. Eh, doesn't really tell you much, does it? Who's us? So sometimes you've got to back up a little further. So back up to above 1-1. One, one. i got a giant G. It takes up four lines in my Bible here. Back up before that. And what's the next big letters you got in your Bible there? What's that spell? Hebrews. Hebrews. My Bible says the epistle of Paul, the apostle, to the Hebrews. Are you the Hebrews? I don't believe you are the Hebrews. Turn to chapter 3. Let's dig in a little deeper and see if we can find who he is, has in mind when he's writing this. How I many did have that, the epistle of Apostle Paul to the Hebrews? Okay. Some Bibles don't have that it's written by Paul. And that's debated among scholarship. <clears throat> it's a little more complicated, but look in chapter 3 and verse 8. I believe there's a good reason for that. Uh, Hebrews 3 and verse 8. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Lots and lots of Old Testament references here. Verse 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Now, who's he writing to? We already got that answer. The Hebrews. So when he references the Hebrews and he references their history, he says, your fathers. Now, Paul doesn't write like that to the church. My father is God the Father, and I'm saved because I'm in the line of Judah spiritually through Jesus Christ, through an incorruptible seed. Not physical circumcision, not keeping the law, not going to the tabernacle. So those church fathers, or not church fathers, excuse me, those Old Testament fathers are not my fathers in that sense. They're not my fathers. They're Jewish people's fathers. It's a physical connection that they have to them. So Hebrews is written to them. Uh, you find the contrast in Romans 11. Romans 11. This, I would quote it for you, but I don't have the whole thing in my head. Romans 11:28. I do have it. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies. That's the Israel today. Romans eleven twenty eight. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Not your Father's sakes. Paul's writing this to the church. When he references Israel, he references their fathers. Look back in Hebrews, back at verse 14. Hebrews 3.14, for we, it's going to be we Hebrews, we Hebrews are made, for we are made partakers of Christ. What's the next word? If we do what? Keep holding on. That is not Baptist, New Testament, Pauline, Epistle doctrine. It's Hebrew doctrine. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto what? The end. The end of what? Go back to Hebrews 6, or 10, Hebrews 10. Let's take this context and see if we can fit it in history, or rather in the future. If we Hebrews, verse 26... Sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. If you cross-reference that to Malachi 4, Matthew 3, 2 Thessalonians 1, fiery indignation is the second advent when the Lord comes back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that, know, and that obey not the gospel of the truth. That fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries is a second advent reference. Verse 28, he that despised Moses' law. Somebody's under the law here and has to hold fast their profession. You say, I've never heard this stuff before. Well, that's because you're too Baptist. That's why. And I apologize to you for the Baptist influences that you've had. And we are a Baptist church, and I believe the Baptist distinctives. But I also don't let the Bible get trumped by the Baptist distinctives. 
Turn to Romans 4. Romans 4. That thing continues with vengeance belongeth to me. I will recompense. The Lord shall judge his people. That's always the nation of Israel. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's all second advent references. That would be the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennium. I'll go to Romans 4. When you get Romans 4, place a marker there or just hold your hand there and I want you to get James 2. When you're listening to somebody speak or when you're in a conversation, you're always trying to establish baselines. A baseline is, uh, here's my baseline. I don't smile that much, right? So if you just take a glance at me, you're like, man, is he angry? No, I'm deep in thought, but you don't know my baseline until you know me a little bit, okay? So my wife looks at me and says, what are you thinking about? And other people in the store are like, are you angry? I'm like, no, I got... I got stuck in a concrete pour, and how is it going to fit when the framers put this bolt in the corner and my rebar's in? That's where I'm at, and it's just comes across as, as displeasure on my face, but it's just deep thought. Now, that's a baseline. So what's my baseline for, for teaching this? I believe in salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. I got saved in April. Uh, no, no, no. That was the old date. I actually found the real date. March 27th, 1988. March 27, 1988, when I met my Sunday school teacher, and she had it written down, and I finally got the real date. Uh, and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior and accepted his payment for my sins, and I was humble enough in, in my pride sitting there for three weeks and not getting saved. Uh, she said, would you come back in the kitchen if you want to get saved? And I raised my hand and said, I want to get saved, and came back there, uh, Riley Creek Baptist Church. Now, that's my baseline. Look at Romans chapter 4, and I hope you have James 2 in the other hand. Look at Romans 4, and look at verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So you don't work for a gift, you work for a what? A reward. I hope I have some rewards in heaven. I know I have some rewards according to the promises in Scripture. That's what I'm working for. But for my salvation, that's something entirely different. Verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Righteousness. Now, that's salvation. All right? Look at James 2. Verse 21, Was not Abraham... Our Father justified by what? Hmm. How did Abraham get saved? Or let's be specific, justified. He obeyed God, took his son up there, and offered him on an altar. When he offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? You see that? Everybody understand that Abraham had to have some works in order to be made perfect, in order to be justified. I'm using the Bible text words here because this is a complex study that traces over to uh, Genesis 15, Genesis 22, and also back in Romans where we just were. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was what? Imputed. So he got justified. If you want to make a note on this, we're not going to study this whole thing out today. He got justified in 22, justified in Genesis 22. He got imputed righteousness in Genesis 15, verse 6. You can study that on your own time. Let's stay on topic here with what we're looking at. The scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then, here's the point James is making, how that by works a man is justified, and not by what? Faith only. You say, I, Pastor, you just said that you believe that salvation is by grace, through faith, plus nothing. Well, James doesn't believe that for one second. And who's James writing to? Well, if you guess the Hebrews, you'd be right again. Look in verse 1. This time you'll get it in verse 1. James 1.1. 1, 1. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to, now we know who this book is written to, the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad greeting, what's verse 2? 
my brethren, Jewish brethren. Now, do you know that Martin Luther had a time with this thing? Martin Luther went through the ringer over this thing. Over what thing? James 2, 24. Standing before the Pope with the cardinals there, holding this verse right in his face. You're teaching salvation by faith in those, mon in those uh, Catholic churches that you're preaching in, Luther. <clears throat> and we know, according to James 2, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And he would quote Galatians to them. And they would quote James. And he would quote Romans. And they would quote James or Hebrews. And he would quote Romans and Galatians again. And they would quote James and Hebrews again. And it went round and round and round. And Martin Luther wrote in his diary, I would like to light my fire with the book of James. <laughs> and his wife's name was Katie. He said, Galatians is my Katie. And I would like to light my stove with the book of James. Because he couldn't understand it. Now, what did Martin Luther miss? He missed a couple things <laughs> here and there. Uh, he didn't run from the Catholic Church fast enough. That's what he missed. But he did a good work in his day. He couldn't understand how that James said, you see that how by works a man is justified, not by faith only. Look at verse 25. I mean, the whole just keeps digging deeper. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now, we know Old Testament, a man had to have works. It's pretty clear. I don't know how you can miss that. You got to have a sacrifice. That's a lot of work. You got to show up at the temple three times a year. You got to keep the law. That's a work. Ten commandments. Those are works for salvation. Verse uh, James 2.10 For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. This is all about keeping the law in the book of James. Alright, go to James uh, uh, no, 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 Romans 8. No, James 2. I didn't want to finish the chapter. 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Is your body without the spirit dead? Think about that for a second. If you lose your breath, you're dead. But I'm talking doctrinally here. You have a body and a soul and a spirit. And before you're saved, don't you have a dead spirit? According to Ephesians 2 and Romans 8, 10. Romans 8, 10. Romans 8, 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is what? Your body is dead. And how is your body dead? But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Your body in the New Testament is dead because your spirit is alive. And so you have 20 verses in the New Testament that go along the tune of reckon yourselves to be dead. Indeed, it's already true, but you need to act like it's true. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Uh, I am, uh, we are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God. You're dead. Your body's dead. And James says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That doesn't even make sense to Pauline New Testament doctrine for body, soul, and spirit. So what's the difference? Let's read James 2, and let's put it into a category that we put Hebrews in and see if this fits the tribulation. Let's just try it out for size. My brethren, verse 1, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. I, taught, I, taught, I explained this to somebody one time, and they're saying, You believe in salvation by works, and what about grace? Grace is required in every time frame all through the Bible. He said, What about grace and faith? Faith is required in Abraham and Noah and all the way back, and today, and in the future. The issue is works being involved or not, and works is an exceptional thing. Works is the exception to the rule today where we don't need works for salvation. All right. Verse uh, 2, James 2, 2. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring, we're in the tribulation here, goodly apparel, there come also a poor man in vile raiment. How'd this guy get a gold ring if we're in the tribulation? How's he still have his gold ring? If people are starving and can't buy and sell, according to the book of Revelation in three places, if they don't have a mark. Tribulation. How's this guy got any money at all? So this guy comes to your house, and ye have respect, verse 3, unto him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, 
Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit there under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? Now, we've been over this before, but are all the poor people in Billings rich in faith? <laughs> Do the homeless people that stab each other every other week here in downtown Billings <laughs> have a rich amount of faith? How come the poor people in James are righteous and the rich people are evil? Are all the rich people today evil? I don't think so. You say, who do you consider rich? Does anybody have a gold ring on today? That'd be you. <laughs> you're rich. Does that make you evil? Because in James, you're evil. Why? Well, you had to do something to get that gold ring or not trade it and pawn it off to feed your kid. Heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him, verse 6, but ye have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. You find that stuff in Matthew. Do, they not, uh, do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So it's all about keeping a works system in this time frame. Why do people teach sinless perfection? Answer, because of verses like these. Why do people teach that you have to not sin in order to keep your salvation? All right, let's get another one. Luke 8. Luke 8. There's no shortage of them. How many of you know a religion and somebody in that religion that believes that they have to keep doing good works so that they might or hopefully make it to heaven? How many of you? Right? This is why. They're not all just um, imbeciles. They don't understand how to rightly divide the scriptures. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. How would you rightly divide it? Well, here's a way. Let's not read mail that's not written to us and then preach it on... Sunday morning and twist it to fit Baptist doctrine. Let's just let it say what it says, to whom it was spoken. Luke 8. Here's the parable of the sower and the seed. If you wanted to start, you'd start around verse 4 or 5. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, some fell on a rock, in verse 6, among thorns, verse 7, good ground, verse 8. Now, these parables vary in the Gospels, so I picked Luke for a reason. Look at verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should what? Believe and be saved. Did these people get saved? No, they didn't. The devil took the seed out and they didn't believe. They, he took it so they couldn't, should, should not believe. Verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root which for a while what? Believe. And in time of temptation, they fall away. There's that falling away again. Who is this group? That which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring, forth, uh, bring no fruit to perfection. So it's easy to say 14 is saved and no fruit. It's easy to say 12 is not saved. But those guys in 13 on the rock, they believed. And in a time of temptation, they fell away. Now, if you want to teach Baptist doctrine, you just say they had a head belief and not a heart belief. And then you solve it and go to the next one. All right, so go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. You can Baptistify your way out of anything. But it'd be better just to let the scriptures seem to contradict, and then you could find out where your interpretation is wrong because you're the one that has a contradiction, not the scriptures. All right, Galatians 5 and verse 4. How does Paul use that phrase, fallen, uh, falling away? Here's how Paul uses it to Christians. Galatians 5, verse 4. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now, if you're fallen from grace in the New Testament, under Pauline doctrine, it's a guy who thinks he's justified by the law. That guy wasn't saved, ever. He was trying to do good works. He's claiming to be saved. 
And then you ask him how he's saved, and he says, like the classic Billings, Montana statement, I got baptized. Well, you fell from grace, buddy. Grace was available. You had it. You approached it. You came right up nigh unto it, and you didn't have it. You fell from it. Verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Whose love? Maybe Christ's love for you. You did run well. Okay, and then it goes on to preaching. All right? Look at Ephesians. Mm, we could get more here in Galatians, but let's go. Uh, Galatians 3 is good. Let's do Galatians 3 1. Everybody should know this verse. Galatians 3 1. Very, very clear that salvation is not by works. Galatians 3 1. In preparing this lesson, I wanted to make sure that I didn't just show you all the work salvation verses and then leave you like, there's a lot of works. Maybe I should rethink this. So I tried to even it out. So here's why. I'm going to Paul's uh, uh, epistles and then showing you other verses. So Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath, what's the next word? That's a pretty strong word. Who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Pastor Dixon, let me send this to him. Did you receive the Spirit, capital S, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And he would say, by the hearing of faith. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? If you fell away, if you backslid, if you went off into sin, however he, ex he explained it, and I don't know his exact terms that he used, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you saved or aren't you saved? That's a bewitching teaching. That's occultic, that's rebellious, that's not understanding the law, and that's damnable. That's causing people to go to hell by teaching that. All right, now Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Wouldn't be fair to show this lesson without showing some verses that Paul wrote that, again, at cursory glance, seem to imply you can lose your salvation. So did Paul say anything that implies you should uh, be sinless after you're saved? And if you've ever read Paul, you would be like, isn't he telling them all the time, make sure you don't commit these sins? Hey, guys, clean it up over here. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how you get this idea from reading Paul, but here's one place uh, that people point you to. Ephesians 5, uh, let's start in verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear what? All right, saved people here. And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But, three, fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither foolishness, uh, sorry, filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather... This is what should be named among you. That guy is known for giving of thanks. Now, that's just regular old preaching. Don't let that stuff be named among you. You can preach on all those different individual sins. You'd be good to look them up in a dictionary and get them preached correctly. For this you know, verse 5, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now, what are you going to do with Ephesians 5 and verse 5? Let's open it up. What are you going to do with Ephesians 5, 5, if you've got any guesses? Does that teach you can lose your salvation? Now we're on Pauline doctrine, talking to, talking to children in the church, saved people. Okay, that's one answer. One answer is this doesn't say anything about your salvation. It's talking about your inheritance. However, doesn't it look like the inheritance that you receive when you get to heaven in the kingdom of Christ and God? I mean, how do you get to the kingdom of Christ and God, right? 
if you're a whoremonger, unclean person, covetous, who's an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So one answer, and I suppose this is an acceptable answer by the grammar, is that these are talking about your inheritance. Okay? How about verse 6? Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Well, the wrath of God comes on lost people who do these things, and it also comes on saved people who what? Do these same things. Yep. Yep. Be not ye, verse 7, therefore partakers with them. Uh, is there a cross-reference in Colossians to a very similar passage? What, what's the one in Colossians? Because I don't think you can get out of that with the inheritance answer. Let's try that. That was what I had in mind when I... Well... That's the Colossians is the easier one. I did pick the more difficult one. So Ephesians is the more difficult one to explain. Colossians is much simpler. All right. So I want to show you one more thing out of here. You could say it's the inheritance. I don't know that it, that's 100% fitting. Because this you know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Um, how many of you have ever told a lie? Raise your hands up high. Come on. If you're not raising your hand, you're lying. All right. Got everybody. All right. Turn to Revelation 21. Hold your place in Ephesians 5, if you like. Revelation 21. Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful. Anybody ever been afraid before? Of something you shouldn't have been afraid of? And unbelieving. Well, that makes sense. Got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So unbelieving makes very good sense. The abominable. That can mean a lot of things. And murderers. And whoremongers. And sorcerers and idolaters, and all what? Liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, how do you get out of that one? I don't know if you understand what you're reading there. You quote that in the Romans Road, if you sneak it in to get a hell, a hell passage in the Romans Road, or maybe use it in uh, soul winning to show people all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, that second death is the death after you die in hell, which turns into the lake of fire if you read the previous chapter. Now, how do you get out of that if every one of you raised your hand and said you're a liar? Said you, actually, said you've told a lie. How do you get around that? Look at the verse before it. Verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Are you working to overcome in order to be saved? I'm not. There's some things I'm working on overcoming, for sure, but not for my salvation. So you're reading a works salvation passage in Revelation 21, verse 8. You say, maybe I shouldn't use that for soul winning. I would still use it for soul winning because they're liars and they're going to hell. <laughs> All right. But what are you? Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And if you held your place in Ephesians 5, this you know that no whoremonger, unclean person, covetous man, idolater. Did you notice in Ephesians 5 it changed the, the tense or it changed the way it was referring to those sins? In verse 3 it listed the sins. In verse 5 it listed the person. It says, but fornication, that's a sin. It didn't say fornicators. Uncleanness, it didn't say unclean person. Covetousness, it didn't say covetous person. 
Did you notice the distinction there in Ephesians 5? He says, don't let the sins be named among you, but no whoremonger, unclean person, covetous man, they don't have an inheritance in Christ and God. I'll go so far as to say they're not going to be there because there's no covetous men in heaven. There's no, uh, what's the list, idolater, unclean person, whoremonger, or sorcerers, or abominable, or fearful, or liars in heaven. There's none. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, and I'll show you doctrinally, and then we'll be done. 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 9, you know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you could say that's just your inheritance, but they're not going to be there. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, that's a person. That's not fornication, the sin, that's a person. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkard, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. That goes a little beyond the inheritance in the kingdom of God. That's inheriting as a gift, as an heir, as a receiving because of being a child, the kingdom of God, which you are already promised in Matthew chapter 6. You're already promised in John chapter 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the... That's how I'm getting to the kingdom of God. All right? Verse 11. And such... What's the next word? Underline that. Highlight it, circle it, take a crayon. Such were some of you. When? Before you were saved. But ye are something else. You are not a liar. You are not a sorcerer, abominable, or fearful, or unbelieving. Ye are washed. Ye are something else. Ye are sanctified. Now you're to be sanctified and sanctify your flesh and have some sanctification in your life, but... Spiritually, you're already sanctified. You are sanctified, if you're saved. But ye are what? Justified. Amen. Was not Abraham justified by works? Well, good for him. I'm not. <laughs> I am justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. So much so, verse 12, all things are lawful unto me. Does that mean you can live however you want? I'm only going to say this once, but yes. There's a girl that ought to be here this morning as part of our church who heard this teaching, very clearly taught, understood it. It was a help to her and went back to the world, and all things are lawful unto her. And I pray for her, and I know some of you do too, but all things are not expedient. You say, well, she wasn't really saved. Well, she didn't really mean it. She's as saved as you are. She knows it. She knows better. She's kind of miserable. And it's not expedient. All things, I'll only say it once, but Paul said it twice. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And then he goes on to say, don't you know your body has a purpose? Don't you know your bodies are the members of Christ? Don't you know you're part of a body that's not supposed to be joined to Harley? Don't you know that the sins you do in your body affect your body and affect other people's bodies and that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God and you're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify the Lord in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He owns your body. And he desires that you use your body to serve him because you love him, not because you're legally bound to do so or you lose your salvation. Now he didn't do that to Abraham. The Lord's allowed to do whatever he wants to do. Nobody else knows. He's allowed to do that. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes down from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ rise first and we which are alive and reign are caught together with them and so shall we ever be with the Lord and then all the Catholic churches put on their signs, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Ye must be born again. You know the Catholics are always a dispensation behind? What do they teach now? Work salvation. What are they starting to put on their signs now? I kid you not, I saw you must be born again on the Catholic church before they sold it uh, over on 4th Avenue and Broadwater. They're shifting. There's going to be a dispensation behind after the rapture happens. And a guy's going to drop on his knees and say, Oh, man, I thought I did it right. Oh, I thought I was good. I got baptized. I meant it, God. I meant it. I trust in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Lord, come into my heart and save me. I repent of all my sins or whatever prayer he heard or thinks he ought to say. And what happens to him in the tribulation? 
Well, there's a guy with a big rubber stamp putting marks on people, however it happens. And God says you take that mark and you go to hell. Is that works? Not taking the mark is works. Yep. And you better do some other things. You better do what James said and not pay respect to the rich people. And you better do some other things. Help your brethren that are poor. And you better do some other things. You better keep the law. And believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved is not going to apply to the tribulation saint like it applied to the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. That's just a guess on the Catholic Church and their signs. But they're always behind a step. They'll be behind all the way to the end. You're not in the flesh, Romans 8 9, but in the Spirit. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Brethren, you are not in the flesh. That's over and over. That's Romans 7. That's the next part of that question we'll answer next time. You are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. And as many of us as are in the Spirit are led of the Spirit of God. And people use that verse to prove that if you're saved, then you'll follow the Spirit of God. And it didn't say you'll follow Him. It said you'll be led of Him. You ever been led of somebody and not followed them? <laughs> okay. Like your kids at the store all the time? Well, you were leading them. If you're led of the Spirit, if you're saved, if you're of the Spirit of God, I'm, quote, I'm loosely quoting uh, Romans 8 again. We'll cover these next time. Then you are led of the Spirit of God. Now, why don't you not worry about being sinlessly perfect. I know I didn't answer that. We'll answer it next time. Why don't you not worry about being uh, eradicating your sin nature, having a second work of grace, and living uh, a life of holiness, although those are good things to, to strive for. But if you're going to put yourself... Nope, I'm getting ahead. Stop talking, Isaac. You're done. You got enough verses for tonight. Lord, I ask you please bless this lesson. As you help us to uh, chew on what we heard tonight and bless the teaching, the follow-up on this next time. And as you please help us, like we said, to glorify you, to try to use our body that uh, is glorifying you as a temple, as a tool that you're pleased with in your hands, Lord. As you help us with that every day this week, as we go our separate ways, that uh, we put our affections on things above, not on things on this earth, and that we glorify you with what we do. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.